hold, hold on a second. Uh, is it? Okay. Let's see whether we could, Ali, uh, fix this one here. I can, I can, you have to, you have to flip it. Is the, vo- is the voice is good? Is, is it clear? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Don't change anything, please. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. No, Ali, it's not perfect. I cannot see. No. So in yes. one minute, no. people should start coming in. So the microphone here, if you plug it. Is it getting here. recorded or somebody is recording it or? Yeah, it's or, recorded. And I think they okay. will also um, put it on the on the website later on, you know, all the recordings. Okay. Is this the first time for everybody with the horizons or you, uh, you had this experience before? I've been well, in, in previous ones myself, um, but not when it was in Portugal. They had them in Luxembourg and Switzerland at one time, so it's some years ago. Yeah, and it was also, it was also not Zoom, I guess, right? So that's no, the, no, no. They were physical. Yeah. 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 So on yeah. Zoom, yeah, it's a first time experience. Yes. Yeah. Was it a big event when you when you joined it uh, a year ago or two years ago? A big event, but yeah, it was okay. I mean, it's quite all right in terms of uh, the size. Yeah. Oh, so you actually, you know, went to the physical one, Sanjeev? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Well, it's my first time. It's my first time. Uh, they invited me to uh, to speak, so uh, this is my first experience with them. So it became with Zoom. So yeah, look like the new now it's Zoom really. Yeah, the new world, the new governance structure is all on is all on the internet. Actually, actually, as uh, many government, including Saudi Arabia, they have done really an outstanding good job with uh, IT and with the communication. What took long time to g- gather everybody's under one umbrella. Now it's a matter within minutes you could uh, get everybody's. Uh, in a meeting, and then everybody go back to work as a normally. Within two hours, everything is done or finished. Yeah. Yep. Hello, Miguel. Welcome to our session. So I guess um, it is now two past nine. You know, let's get started. I would suggest. Okay. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Danny Kopikam. I warmly welcome you to panel discussion on rewriting the rules of governance. The immediate human and economic cost of COVID-19 is uh, severe. It threatens to scale back years of progress on reducing poverty and inequality and to further weaken social cohesion and global cooperation. Joblessness, a widening digital divide and disruptive uh, disruptive social interaction and abrupt shifts in markets could lead to dire consequences and lost opportunities for large parts of the global population. In addition, widening gaps in digital literacy risk creating a digital underclass. Workers and students excluded from digital resources will miss the educational and employment opportunities constantly being created by the global digital economy. It is uh, estimated that by 2025, 97 million new jobs may emerge from the division of labor between humans and machines. Digital exclusion of billions of workers worldwide increases the risk of a livelihood crisis and is likely to exacerbate social cohesion erosion two of the highest likelihood and highest impact risks of the next 10 years. I'm honored to introduce three distinguished gentlemen that will initially share their perspectives uh, on these challenges and suggestions on how to change the rules of governance accordingly. I will then open the floor for an active discussion. Uh, dear audience, feel free to add any comments and questions using the commenting tool. Uh, we can then pick them up and discuss. You can also grab the mic if you want to get something off your chest immediately and um, using you know, the grab the mic function here in the, in the tool. Without further ado, let me introduce you to our panelists. I would like to start with uh, His Excellency Dr. Turki Faisal Al-Rashid. Dr. Al-Rashid is a businessman, author, and academic. 
He is the founder and CEO of Golden Grass Inc., an agriculture and contracting company based in Saudi Arabia. He is an adjunct professor at the College of Agriculture and Life Science at the University of Arizona and also the author of more than half a dozen books. His most recent publication is uh, Public Governance and Management Capabilities, Public Governance in the Gulf States. He's currently working on Saudi Arabia's transformation, uncertainty, and sustainability. Welcome, uh, Dr. Al-Rashid. I further welcome Mr. Sanjeev uh, Kumar. Sanjeev is an award-winning serial entrepreneur and established author based in, uh, in London. He's currently director and CEO at uh, DNO Group World and also the founder of DTM Global Holdings. Sanjeev is further the ex executive director of Harley Street Healthcare Group PSC and the recipient of Southeast Asia Young Achievers Award and the winner of the Global Indian of the Year 2020-21 Award. As in, uh, Sanjeev has authored um, five books, also a, uh, is also a prolific blogger. Uh, his blogs can be seen on his website, uh, sonikumar.com. Welcome, uh, Sanjeev. And final, our final panelist is um, Mr. Philip Waits. Philip is an accomplished uh, governance expert, author, entrepreneur, auditor, and banker. He has over 50 years global banking experience and seen in senior audit roles for several leading banks, such as uh, EFV, HSBC, and Citibank. Very relevant to this panel, Philip is also the founder of the Enhanced Banking Governance GmbH in Zurich, provides governance services to boards of directors, audit committees, and executive management to strengthen their corporate governance framework. Philip is a member of the uh, Hogama Institute for Corporate Governance in Dubai, the European Corporate Governance Institute, the Audit Committee Institute, and the Association, Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. Welcome, you know, Philip, to this panel. I would now like to hand the word to Dr. Rashid to share his perspectives on the topic. Over to you. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm happy to be uh, here. Today, we are going to talk about assessment and achievement of the Saudi vision 2030 to diversify its econo economy. Most of us know that in order to get things done, we go to someone who know who has uh, some power or related to powerful people. However, that uh, leave out the people who don't know uh, any powerful people. With uh, public uh, sector services, all people must count. And now with Saudi Vision 2030, we know that all people can access important and improved uh, government services. Recognizing those problems was the first step. The Saudi leadership uh, contracted with international consultant to deliver a national strategy <laughs> to diversify uh, the uh, economy and improve the public sector services, improve the quality of uh, life, reduce the unemployment, improve the health care, improve the education, the recreation, the tourism, the e-government services, and the infrastructure. The leadership recognized that before the launch of the long-term vision, public, se public sector services often fail to meet the expectation of citizen in delivering satisfactory services. Uh, the, to take all this uh, issue, consultant and expert were put in place to deliver state of the art. Uh, were put in place to deliver the state of the art strategies, program, initiative, and vision uh, 2030. Those experts met the necessary requirement of agility, efficiency, motivation, education, and experience, all important quality to strength and achieve the program and the uh, initiative. The Saudi leadership, uh, they 
they check, they they trained all the civil servant executive to local and the for the transformation. Transition of the private sector leader into the executive uh, process, uh, policies, and procedure require to achieve changes. The leaders need to learn and relearn government office protocol and communication. They need to learn the procedure to receive approval from a multi-level of government chain of command. And finally, they need to learn how to work with the public sectors, stakeholders. One of the main factor in enabling and motivating those private sector leaders to make the uh, move to the public sector was the uh, opportunity to be part of the transformation. That would impact the kingdom and the region at large. <clears throat> Achieving Saudi Vision 2030 and the associated uh, re uh, restrictions of government institutions had led to several dramatic shifts in the public sector institution. Recruiting private sector executive for leadership position in the public sector reflect the strategy, objective, promoted, and the new approach in the public sector and enhance the public-private network and partnership. Institution has also uh, reformed and are providing outstanding services with dignity to service uh, receiver. Outdated bureaucracy process were removed when the government provided e-services to the citizen and resident. Now, it's all available online. And that is the result of a collective uh, group uh, merging their experience. A big victory, actually. Let me close with uh, Gandhi's quote. Uh, good uh, government is not substitute for self-government. I'll be happy to receive your questions. And for any more details about this subject, you could go to www.tfrashid.org. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Al-Rashid. Uh, Sanjeev, um, please share your perspectives. Thank you, Dr. Al-Rashid. Uh, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, very insightful information on what's happening in, in, in Saudi. And for us, uh, sitting at the sit, sitting outside, it's, it's, it's interesting to hear all that. So thanks for sharing it. And thanks, Daniel, for doing this. Really appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Philip. I uh, look forward to hearing you. You know, for, for me personally, I mean, the title rewriting the rules of governance kind of got me a bit excited because, uh, you know, when Frank suggested, I said, well, this looks uh, pretty much something that I keep thinking about and keep writing about. And, you know, the way the way I look at it, governance is, uh, you know, it's uh, it's not a new subject. It's been around as long as humans being have been around. So it's been around for millions of years. I mean, we started governing ourselves right when we were clans and we were figuring out how to do things. We had limited resources, so we wanted to kind of figure out what sort of resources we will have. So we decided on a principle-based uh, kind of, uh, you know, governance that I think, uh, uh, you know, we uh, we had an interaction with uh, Philip, and he did mention in the email a couple of times that, you know, principle-based versus rule-based. And I think the whole idea of governance started, uh, you know, uh, close to a million year ago, I would say, when, uh, you know, our ancestors came up with this principle-based uh, governance. Then, you know, it slowly evolved into a king and the kingdom and, the you know, and the advisors decided what the governance might be. And then we became a uh, nation state. So you had uh, nation states deciding what the governance might be. The government decided 
And then you be, then you have free democracies. So free democracies put in parliaments, etc., and uh, they legislated and uh, representative democracy, for example, not Switzerland, but uh, countries like ours, where we think we are democracy, but we have we elect a representative, and the representative decides on our behalf. So we outsource our decision making. So you know that's that's the that's the reality of it. Uh, you know, so we we any idea has a has a shelf life. I think personally, that's my own experience. Uh, you know, democracy uh, as an idea started. You have the governance as the concept. Now, what's happening? Uh, and you know, whether you know, I mean, if you look at governance, has a lot of other inputs as well. So if we are looking at agencies, doc, uh, Dr. Al Rashid talked about how Saudi government is trying to uh, transform, you know, uh, governance to empower more people. And I think that's, uh, that's, that's the right thing to do. I think if we empower more people and if it's more people centric governance, uh, then, you know, whether you are, you know, you are governing a bank or whether you are uh, uh, governing a, a tech company, a large tech company, or whether you are governing yourself, I think as long as there is people-centric approach, I think we will have a bit of principle-based governance and to make sure there is a bit of compliance and there has to be compliance of the principle, you will have to build in rules. And and sometimes what happens is people don't focus more on the principle, but people for more focus on the rules and in compliance with the rules. So that's where you have regulators uh, more focused on the rule-based governance uh, then why the governance was put in place anyways. And that's the debate. That's a debate that we can have forever. Uh, but I'm not too sure if we can uh, if we can come to a point where we can all agree or everybody will agree to it. Because uh, if you go to uh, the legis- legislators, I mean, they feel empowered because they get elected uh, by society, by people, and they feel that they should be the one who should be deciding what's, what sort of, governance architecture that should be in place. Uh, my my approach to whole thing is, you know, so, you know, if we are living in a Western democracy, the, uh, you know, the society, the thought process will be different. Uh, if we are living in a developing part of the world, the thought process of the society will be a bit different. So when we are talking about a standard global a template of governance is very hard to achieve because there is also the input from within the society, the aspirations of the society, uh, and this is where this is where you know we have this discussion uh, back and forth on globalization, how to govern globalization, how to govern banking institutions, how to govern tech companies, how to govern you know tax regime. So all of that kind of complicates the matter because. You know, every society has different thinking. Even in Western Europe, the Scandinavians have a different thinking to a German thinking or, you know, a French thinking, for example. So what what needs to happen is I think what we need to agree on, in, in my view personally, when we are talking about rewriting the rules of the governance, is we need to understand that, you know, no idea is perfect. It has to be a f- evolving kind of approach. We will need to put in ideas and know that, okay, this... These ideas will need to be reinvented. Uh, the principles will need to be revisited. We will need to re- revisit the principles. We will need to keep upgrading the rules of, uh, you know, putting the governance in place and intact. Uh, and, and, you know, and I would just conclude with the idea that, look, there is a lot of learning that we can do from nature itself, how nature governed itself. So nature has put in principles and nature has put in laws of nature to make sure that these governance structures are in place. So, so that is what I will conclude with. And I'm, 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 I'm hoping that we can have a very engaging discussion around it. And I see that there are audience building up in, in, for our panel discussion. So we will, we'll, I'll, I'll look forward to that as well. And again, thanks for the opportunity. And um, I look forward to continuing that discussion from, from this panel. Thank you very much, Sanjeev. So I'm, I welcome Alan and uh, Cyprian uh, to our panel. Uh, please feel free to add any comments or questions, uh, which we can also incorporate into our discussion. And um, yes, uh, I would now like to hand the word to, to Philip to share his perspectives. 
Uh, thank you, <laughs> Daniel, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so here are my initial comments on, on the topic. Yeah, it is true that today there is a lack of trust in the media, uh, politicians, government, business leaders. Uh, we recognize that people are, are not being treated equally or fairly. The planet is being harmed. Rivers are polluted. Oceans are full of plastic. Animals and fish are dying. There is an erosion of the traditional values in society. There's a need for increased governance, accountability, and responsibility. So where are we? How did we get here? And where are we going? So let me uh, make some statements and raise some questions. Um, where are we? And, and where are we going? Everything is being driven by technology today. That is the cause of the accelerated change. And that is causing stress on society. So the future lies in how we govern technology and the changes. Um, when it comes to the accelerated technological change, we have to talk about the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, if you remember that um, it took over a thousand years for the world to complete the agricultural revolution. And that was the first one that's documented. Then maybe 150 years for the first phase of the industrial revolution that brought, brought the transition from manual production methods to machines that used steam and water power. That was during the mid 18th to the mid 19th century. Electricity and mass production were the hallmarks of the second industrial or technological revolution that brought factories, railroads, cars, planes, and radio during the 20th century. Now today, we're at the end of the third revolution, which was digital and comprised of electronics, IT systems, and automation that gave birth to computers, laptops, mobile phones, the internet, e-commerce, social networks, Amazon, Google, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Tinder. That only took 50 years. Now here comes the fourth revolution, and that will happen over the next 25 years. So we go from 1,000 years to 150 years to 50 years, the next revolution, 25 years. The pace of change is changing dramatically, and it will affect everyone that lives on the planet. We will have technologies such as quantum computers, a quantum internet, the internet of things where all Devices are connected, artificial intelligence, genome editing, or augmented reality, robotics, 3D printing. In the Middle East, you have 3D printing of houses I've seen in Dubai. We have 3D printing of bones and body parts. We have smart sensors, smart factories, smart schools, smart cities, which are rapidly changing the way humans behave, interact, and create, exchange, and distribute value. The world in 25 years from now will owe a lot of its character to how we think about, invest in, deploy, and govern these powerful new technologies. Previous industrial revolutions liberated humankind from animal power, made mass production possible, and brought digital capabilities to billions of people. This fourth industrial revolution is, however, fundamentally different. It is characterized by a range of new technologies that are fusing the physical, digital, and biological worlds, impacting all disciplines, economies, and industries, and even challenging ideas about what it means to be human. So how good and how bad are the governance rules that we have today? What do we need to change in terms of rules? Um, I said at the outset there is a need for increased governance. My view is not just about the rules, and yes, society does need rules in order to maintain law and order. But when it comes to governance, there is no lev level playing field. Everybody does it. There are so many different flavors of it. When it comes to uh, governance in the United States, you have rules-based governance where companies have to comply or else meaning there are consequences for non-conformance. Other countries like the UK have a governance code based on principles with a comply or explain policy, which leads to extensive reporting in the annual financial reports. Others like South Africa have a principles-based code with a comply and explain framework, driven by Mervyn King, who I think is one of the world's greatest leaders of governance, and South Africa is now on King 4 of their governance code. And he introduced the concept of 
taking account the um, needs of all stakeholders of companies, um, not just the shareholders. It's not about just adding shareholder value. It's society, it's the workers, it's all stakeholders. In the UAE, there's a governance uh, rules for, st for uh, stock exchange listed companies. But you read the code, it says state controlled entities are excluded. So it applies to companies that are listed. Unlisted companies don't follow the code. Family run businesses don't have to comply with the code. Sovereign wealth funds don't have to comply with the code. So what codes exist? Well, sovereign wealth funds, for example, they complete a self-assessment every three years of their implementation of the Santiago principles, which they send to the International Forum of Sovereign Wealth Funds, a voluntary organization of global sovereign wealth funds. Ah, they created it themselves, and every three years they do a self-assessment. Is that the same of every, as everybody else's? No. So I think one of the things we have to do moving forward is to have harmony of corporate governance codes that certainly for governments and for companies have an, a, a significant impact on, on society. Okay. Um, as we found out in the United Kingdom, a privately owned business, British Home Stores, BHS, collapsed. Okay. There was a big hole in the pension fund. So it's reported that that was a case of uh, where a wealthy few got wealthier while 11,000 workers and 22,000 pensioners are now in difficult circumstances. So good governance is just as important in private companies as in listed companies. So I leave you with that thought to think about as we move into the debate. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, so, dear audience, um, thanks for attending this panel. If you have any questions, comments that we should include in our discussions, please uh, post them in the in the comments section. So, I would now like to start the you know an open discussion uh, really between you know the the panelists. Um, my first question would be um, you know also related to something that Sanjeev has said. Um, you know, how can we? achieve um, a, um, you know, this harmonization on, on governance codes. Um, it is difficult, there are different countries, different, you know, systems. Um, can there be a body that enacts, you know, some guidance rules, um, you know, that can be followed uh, by the different stakeholders? Maybe Sanjeev, you know, uh, a question to you first. No, I appreciate it. And that's a good question and very open-ended, you know, uh, and connects with what uh, Philip and uh, Dr. Al Rashid was saying. So, you know, uh, so, I mean, so Al Rashid, uh, Dr. Al Rashid in, uh, started the conversation and made a very interesting point about if you're powerful, you create your own governance. It's as simple as that. If you're very powerful, you create your own government, but the ordinary people just have to follow rules. Uh, and this is where we are as a society. Uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, only limited amount of people have benefited from globalization. The rest of the society hasn't. And one of the reasons why I, I, my theory is that Brexit happened, disconnect with the gov uh, government is happening around the world, is because uh, people, the society of a nation state, a democracy, they feel that, you know what, I, 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 and there is larger geopolitics and I understand that there is a bigger world, but I need something for myself. I need to make sure I just feel and experience that my life has improved. Now, let me give you an example. So there was a there was a proposal by Janet Yellen that look, we will work out a global minimum tax regime. Now, I was very sure that this will not work out. I mean, even in the United States, this will not work out. I mean, you have Republican now saying, sorry, it's not going to work for us. So so I mean, what I'm trying to portray here is even within the within one nation. You have different approaches. So one, you know, one government, the, the, the Secretary of State, uh, uh, in this case, Janet, Janet Yellen, is suggesting that, okay, we should go for a global minimum tax. For a lot of people in Europe, it makes a lot of sense. But even in, in the United States, it's very hard to get that, to, let, to get the Republicans on board with it. Uh, we have United Nations. We have WTO. So these are all organizations that we have in place. We have WHO. Look at the example of WHO. Now, if you're a United States or if you're a powerful state, 
you can simply tell the WHO guy to just bugger off. You know, I mean, you can give me all the governance you want, but you can bugger off. It's not for me. But if you're a tiny, tiny state in Africa, you are completely dependent on WHO uh, because you just don't have the, you know, you're not that mighty and powerful. So the question that we need to ask is that if we have created, you know, multilateral agencies and organizations like United Nations, WHO, WTO and all of that is we have put in place and we fund them. I mean, it would be nice if we start following the guidelines, if we start following it and say, you know what, that's fantastic. We will we will work with it. Look, I have been in conversation with our, you know, government agencies and our ministers without embarrassing them. They say, ah, screw WHO. We will do what we need to do. I mean, you think, wow, this is, if we go and say, you know what, I am playing football, but I want the referee to be for working for me, but I want the, the goalie uh, of the opposition side to be working for me. Uh, you know what? And I will bend the rules, meaning I will make the rule as it goes. That doesn't, that is not governance, right? Philip talked about, you know, different uh, different parts of the world uh, and how they approach governance. And that is where that is where the discussion needs to happen. We need to have a basic structure in place and it has to be on a voluntary basis. I think we have to we have to emphasize that this has to be a voluntary basis uh, and it has to be people centric. I think if we have a people centric approach. And if we get the society to organize around, I mean, we have climate change activists, we have all these activists. I think what we need is this type of discussion that we are currently having, where more and more people get involved. I think people don't understand how important governance is. You know, people, you know, you talk to the people, Dan, you probably know it. Uh, a lot of people don't question what is your governance structure of your company. Because they say, well, you know, that's fine. I'll give you the check. They're more focusing, focusing on the market, market size, and, and 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 all that. But nobody wants to focus on. Okay, do you understand how you're going to govern yourself? Do you have at least a basic framework of a governance structure of a of a company? Uh, you know, and, and this is the problem. People kind of play with the rules, as as uh, as, as as Philip was insinuating that. You know, I mean, he mentioned a very interesting company, BHS. I mean. It's not that the government didn't know that they are up to something, you know, it's, it's, it is, people knew that there is something going on there, but it's just that it's, uh, there is a loophole put in place and they will exploit it. That's the human nature. So I think, I think we can go, we can move towards the, the question that you raised is a very important one. We can get to that point, but I think it, it will require a lot of conversation and it will require all of us to come together. Mm-hmm. And it requires us to empower when we are empowering WTO, WHO. Uh, we are making them irrelevant. If you're a United Kingdom, if you're a United States, etc., you are making them irrelevant. If you're, uh, you know, if you're becoming as powerful as China, you start setting the rule. You say, well, you know, I have to put my lobby in. It has to serve my agenda. So the global agenda becomes, you know, it has to be my imprint on it. So unless and until we change that thought process. I think the only thing you and I can do, all of us can do, is discuss more, invite more audience, get more buy-in from the audience, and hopefully drive this change slowly. So that's that's my assessment of it. Hmm. Thank you. Dr. Rashid, do you have any views on this? Uh, well, I what we are going through now, whether government or society, I think we're going through a major shift. I mean... If we look in the 20s, in the 1920s, the geopolitical was changing from the Europe, England mainly, to the U.S. And to the rest of the world, really, there wasn't much different. I mean, British and Americans look alike, you know, so there is no culture changes. Now we have a new player, which is the East now is coming up. So there is a change in the geopolitical Uh, changes, the rules that was being made for 70 years, it was really being made to serve the Western world. It's been made to serve the U.S. and uh, Europe. Uh, so now those rules are changes. Then when we talk about the relationship between state and society and individual, 
it has absolutely just flipped upside down. And now society individuals are a very powerful uh, group. They Their social power have improved due to the social media. While in the meantime, the state power have reduced dramatically. I mean, what happened in the in any corners of the world, within minutes, uh, people will watch it on video, they will see it before powerful people, when there is a crime, when there is a mistake, they cover it up and then they they produce it to the public. So they, they clean their dust or they clean their garbage. So now society is empowered. How could government now uh, change its position to satisfy the change in the political arena. I mean, the existing system now, if you go to Europe or to the US, which is, they call them the rich country, uh, they basically just printed paper. And that paper, they could just give it to the rest of the world and they buy their actual goods. So with all these changes taking place now, is... Uh, what is the role of the academia? What is the role of public sector? What is the role of private sector? And then at the same time, the gap between the rich and the poor, I mean, less than 1%. It's not anymore 1%. It's 0.1% who own everything and the 99.9 don't own nothing. So all these changes is taking place and what they call it, we have to avoid uh, the four uh, horsemen of revolution, poverty or death, uh, hungers and uh, war. So that gap, unless we solve it and we solve it quickly and be more innovative uh, to satisfy the political change, to satisfy the requirement of the society, to satisfy the gap between the extreme poor and the extreme rich. I mean, let's talk about COVID now. Uh, 2% of Africa is vaccinated, while 60% in the UK being vaccinated. That gap, we cannot be safe unless everybody is safe. So to conclude my talk is all these rules which has been made for the last 70 years to serve a certain group, which is mainly the U.S. and Europe, now it has to be changed into a more just uh, environment. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, Philip, um, can you please add your views? And also, I want to add one following question. We talked about um, you know, the need you know, for governments to become more people-centric. Huh? And um, you know, can you, do you have some recommendations or ideas how this can be achieved? Okay. Um, uh, thank you, everyone, for your comments. Uh, just to pick up um, uh, the, the the last theme there, uh, the reference to COVID-19 and, and how the world reacted to it. Uh, it hasn't reacted and treated people fairly, as was just mentioned. If we recall at the beginning of uh, 2020, the response uh, from the government leaders in the United States, the United Kingdom, Brazil, for example, was complete denial that it was a real problem. It was a very transitory thing. It would go away on its own. It took three million people to die for them to get serious. And, and we're still not out of the woods, even with all the vaccinations. And, and as uh, was just pointed out in the developing world, uh, less than 2% of the people have been vaccinated. In, in India, we have uh, the Indian variant, which is uh, now becoming dominant in the United Kingdom. Uh, and uh, how the, the leaders have shown leadership has been very disappointing, which leads to the conclusion that people don't trust their political leaders, their government, how they handle situations, the way that um, uh, vaccines like AstraZeneca uh, were handled um, became a political game. Uh, the EU leaders were horrified by it. Um, it, it, it has just been uh, one disaster after another, and, and I'm not too sure uh, how that will play out, but it, it does 
demonstrate that um, the, there isn't moral leadership the, the way that there used to be. And people in countries look to their political leaders to set the tone for moral leadership. And, and when um, you have a president or a prime minister in place that believes in uh, spreading misinformation, and if you spread it often enough, it becomes the truth, that is very dangerous territory that we're moving into. Okay. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're already reaching the end of our session. Um, would uh, each of you please make some you know, closing remarks? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to give it a go. Uh, you know, <clears throat> just uh, I was, I mean, it's an interesting uh, perspective from uh, each of us. And that's that's what discussion is all about, you know. Uh, but what has happened is we are no longer discussing things. Uh, we just want to win an argument. That's what's happening now in our society. So we are entrenched ourselves. We, if we have one viewpoint, if it is we are left, then we are entrenched in the left view. If we are right, then we are entrenched in the right view. Uh, so we are not willing to say, okay, you know what, let me get into a discussion with a fellow human being and let me learn. We are going there with a, a fully loaded, biased and prejudiced approach. And we have bought into it completely. And then uh, we are just going into a discussion. That is not going to be a discussion at all. It's going to be, for me, discussion is where I can learn and I should be able to change my mind because, you know, nobody knows everything. And this, this is what's happening in our society. You have leaders who shouldn't be leaders. Let's put it that way. You have leaders who shouldn't be leaders. Absolutely. And if you have political parties that are giving you choices, when you have a Trump, when you have this type of people, you say, what is going wrong with the political parties? There is something that is fundamentally wrong with the way political parties govern themselves, period. So we need to ask ourselves, we as a society need to ask ourselves, I mean, we feel empowered, but, you know, we talk about social media, but 